Good morning. It's good to see you today. I hope and pray that you will gain a lot by sharing in this Bible study with, the, with me this morning. I hope you'll take your Bible, turn to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. We're going to be looking there at a way to end the various wars that uh, rage around us. And, you know, sometimes the wars that we are talking about aren't wars that take place between the military but it's wars that go on within us, or wars that go on among people around us. And so I know that uh, life is something to be done relationally. And quite frankly, we don't always get along with everybody. And to be honest, we don't always get along with ourselves. I can remember whenever our kids were little, toddler age or so, uh, Kathy would rock them at night, and uh, she would uh, try to memorize some of her Bible memory verses. We were going through a discipleship class together at the time, and uh, there was uh, a time that she had in trying to memorize James chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. And, you know, the verse there says, you have not because you ask not. You ask and you receive not because you ask amiss that you might consume it upon your lust. Well, that's the way the King James Version puts it. Well, I can remember that all of those years ago that Kathy was struggling on that particular memory verse, so whenever she would rock the kids, she would put it to a tune. And she would sing it as a little chorus. And uh, our daughter would have been about uh, two at the time and for whatever reason, I think our kids knew that lust was not a good word. But uh, they knew it was a word that they could say out loud to us and not get in trouble. But whenever they would sing this little ditty that Kathy created with her, uh, they would uh, really emphasize that last word. That you may consume it upon your lust. And they would really make that word sound so ugly whenever they would sing it. You know, this verse in James chapter 4, verse 2, it teaches us uh, in 2 and 3 that the reason we don't have is because we don't ask. And over and over and over again, I have heard preachers use that verse as a model verse for effective prayer. And when reality, it, it's right the opposite. It is, a, it is a model verse to show us what ineffective prayer is. It's a model verse to show us how often we even struggle in our prayer time with God. If you look at the first 12 verses of James chapter 4, you're going to find that even though the book of James in and of itself is a practical, encouraging book, you're going to find that those 12 verses are negative in their approach, and, and, and for a reason. It's so that we will take uh, close personal inventory. This particular chapter, uh, there are several verses in this chapter that are among the most quoted in the book of James. And yet, it begins with a very, very negative connotation. Well, let's just look at verse number one, and let me show you what I mean. James says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? <laughs> that doesn't sound very positive, does it? What causes fights and quarrels among you? And then he answers his own question. He said, don't these fights and quarrels come from your desires that battle within you. So in other words, he was saying right out the gate, if every single one of us as believers were in tune with God, there would never, ever, ever be a fight or a quarrel among us. It's because we allow ourselves to get in the way that we ever have disagreements with anybody else, with God, or even a disagreement with ourselves. Have you ever had an argument with yourself? Have you ever fought back and forth as to what decision you should make? Well, I'm sure you have, because all of us have done that from time to time. 
But he goes on and he says, you want something, but you don't get it. And you kill and you covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have, because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Well, let's stop there just for a second and, and, and look at that just for a moment. You know, uh, he tells us, James is writing the very words inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, and, and he is telling us in this passage, and even though his words are negative, they penetrate and they get through to us, and they said, these words teach us that we've got to get beyond the struggle that's within ourselves. You know, uh, back in those days, there would be individuals that would literally kill to get what they wanted. Back in those days, and even in our day today, there are individuals that will kill your dreams to get what they want in life. And, and it goes on, and, and the scripture is very clear. It says you kill and you covet, but you still don't have what you're looking for. You still push and you fight to get your own way, but you still don't have what you're looking for. You find yourself struggling, quarreling, and fighting. You still don't have what you're looking for. And even when you break down and you ask God, you still don't get what you're looking for. Why? Well, because your motives are wrong. Because your thought process is wrong. You know, there's a passage of scripture that teaches us that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. The scripture also says that if we were to pray according to his will, you could say to this mountain, be removed and it will be removed and cast into the sea and nothing would be impossible for you. Now, many people mistranslate what that verse is saying. Again, it's saying if we are in tune with the will of God, then we would know how to pray in a manner that would please God. We would know how to pray about the things that please God the most. And if it were God's will that a mountain be removed and cast into the sea, then we would pray and it would be done. And nothing would be impossible for us according to the will of God. You know, we think that we ask and if we believe, you know, this is not a name it, claim it mentality. That has never been a part of the doctrine of the church, even though some have tried to make it so. The truth is... You and I are to spend our lifetimes getting in tune with the will of God so that our prayers will become effective. Now, that is what God's plan is for you and I. But back in James's day, there were people at the church who were at war with one another. You know, in the 133rd Psalm, verse 1, the scripture there says, How good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. And, and certainly, as Christians, we ought to be able to live together in unity and harmony, but we don't always do that. And whenever you look back in the days of the early church, you discover that even the early churches in the Bible had their own share of disagreements. The members of the Corinthian church, they were competing with each other uh, in public meetings. They were arguing as to which of their church leaders were the best. <laughs> Some were saying that Paul was the best. Others were saying Apollos was the best. Others were saying, hey, what about Cephas? Oh, let's go back to Peter and the law. Oh, what he taught, it was the best. And uh, Paul made it very clear. He said, is Christ divided? And then he went on to say, you know, I'm glad I didn't baptize most of you. You know, there's only a few of you in this church that I baptized. It would uh, be embarrassing for me to think 
that, that uh, you were acting this way because those of you I taught, I taught you better than that. And, and you know, uh, I, I think today that what God's goal is for you and I is to simply get in tune with his will. And the only way to get in tune with his will is through our study of the scriptures and through our prayer life. You know, I've been doing a, uh, a preaching series on how to listen to God, on hearing God's voice. And, and this coming Sunday, I'm going to be talking about identifying the voice of God and how you can know for sure that it is God's voice speaking and not another voice. And, and to do this, we are reiterating things over and over and over again, and they even apply to this lesson here today. You know, if you and I know the will of God because we are praying and because we know his holy word and we're allowing those to move in our lives, we're going to find out that if we come in contact with a, another brother that, uh, or another sister, uh, we're going to find out that if they are in tune with God too, that we're going to dwell in agreement. I can remember several, several years ago, there was uh, one of the churches I pastored. We had a gentleman come, and there had been a crisis line established uh, in a five-county area in southern Missouri. And uh, we allowed the director of this uh, crisis ministry to come and speak at our church, and he was from a different denomination. And so there was some uh, differing views from his church and our church. But uh, he and I had an immediate connection. And because of that, uh, he asked me if he said, you know, he said, I don't have a radio voice. He said, uh, matter of fact, he said, I'm very awkward in radio type situ situations. And he asked me if I would be willing to go with him to the various radio stations that he had been invited to. And so I agreed to do that. And one day Pete and I were riding along and he said, uh, he said, you know, Mike, he said, with all of the doctrinal dis differences in our church, he said, my spirit agrees with your spirit. He said, uh, I am so very comfortable around you. Our spirits testify. We agree together. So in other words, even though we may have not agreed every point of doctrine in totality, because of our efforts together to seek and find the will of God together, he and I were always in agreement. Always in agreement. We made it a point never to argue about any doctrinal differences between our two churches. And uh, because of that, uh, for about two years, we actually were able to participate in a ministry together, and we saw people over a, over a five-county area in southern Missouri uh, uh, make several phone calls into a radio show that I was able to uh, help do for about two years. And, uh, and we saw many people come through their crisis line and get help. And, and it was all because we found out the value of agreeing about the will of God. Well, certainly, the way that Christian people are going to settle their differences will be, number one, through the Word of God, and number two, through prayer collectively to God. Now, can you imagine in that day and time, um, just because uh, people prayed together, that still didn't mean that their journey was an easy one. They had class wars back then. They had employment wars. There were people who were uh, slaves because they were forced to be slaves. There were people who were slaves because they sold themselves into slavery. And then they had to deal with the rich. And then there were the government officials. You know, it was just a situation that was ripe for contention. Can you imagine, as a Christian, how difficult it would have been for you to have risen above all of that and to be able to dwell in unity with others. Now, not only are we at war sometimes with others, not only do we find ourselves in an incredible disagreement with other people, there are times that we discover that we're at war with ourselves. Have you ever fought against something that you knew was right, you fought against it, 
You knew that, that you weren't going to win that battle with God. You knew that you weren't going to win that battle with yourself. And, and matter of fact, wouldn't it be safe to say, I know that Paul said this, the very temptations that we go through, whenever we allow our pride to get in and, and we do something that's against the will of God, you know, Paul described that struggle in Romans chapter 7. He talked about the war that he had with himself, that he found himself doing the things that he hated doing and uh, forsaking the things that he loved doing. And so there were times when even the Apostle Paul found himself uh, struggling against his flesh and against the Spirit of God yearning him to do something different. You know, no wonder Paul, whenever he looked at himself and then looked at his past, no wonder he referred to himself as the chief of all sinners. So, uh, so today, there are times that we are at war with ourselves. Now, I, I want you to notice what God says about this, beginning in verse 4 of our scripture today. And he's talking, James is writing, to Christian people. But it doesn't sound like it when you get to verse 4. He says, you adulterous people. Now, we need to remember that many times if somebody was writing to a church and used the word adulterous people, he was referring to their unfaithfulness to God. He was referring to the fact that they were worshiping other gods or they were worshiping themselves above God. So he says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God. Well, somebody might quickly say, well, how can that be? Didn't God create this world? Well, I want to remind you, though, that the prince of darkness came in, and through Adam and Eve's sin and everybody's sin thereafter, this world has been contaminated and tainted by sin. And that's why God was going to send his son Jesus to shed every drop of his blood for the sins of the human race. So James is saying, you unfaithful people, you unappreciative people, don't you know that your friendship with the world expresses hostility against God? I wonder how many things that you and I do. What are some of the things that we do in our secret moments, in our quiet times? What are some of the attitudes that we hold that truth be told, it expresses a hostility against the will of God. You know, uh, uh, I have preached messages before on gossiping, and, and I, uh, I learned years ago, I think that the fav my favorite definition of gossiping was uh, from Rick Warren, the pastor of Saddleback Church out in California. And, and he made the statement that gossip, uh, gossiping is a statement or something that may be true or may not be true, but it's not yours to tell. And, uh, and so uh, if you're not a part of the problem, or if you're not a part of the solution, then it's not yours to tell. It's not yours to share. And, and there are times, that's just one of many sins, that sometimes people will find themselves falling into that gossip trap over and over and over and over again. And I have found that if people get caught in that gossip trap very often, pretty soon they are expressing some form of hostility against another believer that Jesus died for. And, and so that's one of the things that, that always draws this red flag to me. Now, uh, or sometimes in our pride or in our greed and our stinginess, uh, there are other ways in which uh, uh, we find ourselves at war with ourselves. And every time that we see ourselves leaning toward the way of the world, we are putting ourselves into a position to express hostility against God. I was at my daughter's house several years ago, and at the time she was a school teacher, and I was in her little office and uh, I actually was sitting down working on a lesson. I was spending some time at her house, and I was working on some stuff. And I looked up, and she had uh, this uh, sign on her desk, and it really, really spoke to, uh, to my heart. 
It said every response to temptation is an act of worship. Which God are you serving? And oh, over the years, how often I have heard those words. Every response to temptation is an act of worship. So in other words, if we overcome that temptation, the God that we're serving in that moment is God our Father, Jehovah God, and his son Jesus. We are lifting them up by proving that we are victorious over that temptation. But if we give in to that temptation, we are giving in to the world. We are expressing hostility against God. We are giving in to Satan, the one who caused the contamination of this world. So again, every temptation that you ever encounter is uh, every response to that temptation will be an act of worship. So which God are you serving today? Now, it goes on to say in verse 4 that anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he who caused to live in us envies intensely? But he gives us more grace. That is why the Scripture said God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't ever want to be found to be at war with God. I don't ever want to be found in rebellion to God. And you know, there are lots of times that if I'm tempted to do something, that giving into that temptation in that moment, in my mind, I don't see it as rebellion because I still love my Lord. But it, in truth, it is. In truth, it is. And, and, and we need to remember that there are some strong scriptures that uh, help to keep us in place. Even Jesus said, by their fruits, you'll know them. And Jesus also said, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Only he who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. And then I want to remind you that we've already covered in James 2.10, the scripture says there, whoever keeps the whole law, but yet is guilty in one point, fails in one point, he is guilty of breaking it all. So we are breaking God's covenant. We are breaking our covenant with God. We are showing hostility to that covenant every time we give in to a sinful act. So again, the next time that you are tempted, just see that as an opportunity to worship. And when you rise above that temptation, you can walk away and say, I just worshiped God because I said no to the temptation. I worshiped God by saying no to the temptation that I was dealing with. Beginning in verse 7, we see some of the most popular verses there in the book of James. And, and these next few verses, we, we hear them often collectively, and we hear them individually. But notice it says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come close to you. So, so just think about those statements. You know, it all begins with an act of submission. The word submission, it gives us the picture of surrender. So we surrender to God. And once we have surrendered to God and we say uh, to Satan when we are tempted, we say, I belong to God now. I don't belong to you anymore. So we resist the devil and the Bible says that he has to flee from us. I want to remind you that every single time that Jesus was tempted in the wilderness by Satan, he would use scripture to defend his point. Uh, that's why it's so important for you and I to know the word of God. Whenever we feel tempted in an area, uh, uh, there ought to be a scripture that pops into your mind that uh, comes as a warning. And it's at that time you could quote that scripture and you'll find out that you will overpower most any temptation if you have scriptures ready in the back of your mind. Uh, you know, uh, scriptures like that will give an account for every idle word that we have ever said. You know, uh, that helps keep me to be truthful and accurate whenever I'm passing on uh, uh, information. It also helps me to uh, 
uh, be kind and considerate and make sure that I pass along only the right kind of information. And that also teaches me that in my emotions, I need to keep steady my emotions. I don't need to become angry because anything that I say, any idle word, any accusatory word that is not proper, I'm going to be held in account, in account for that uh, uh, before God. So every idle word that I've ever said. So I like to keep that verse very, very close to my mind, very close to my heart. And I have found out that it helps me overcome many, many temptations in life. The scripture says, draw nigh unto God or come close to God and he will come close to you. You know, uh, he's already sent us his son. Jesus made the statement, he said, I, when I am lifted up on the cross, I will draw all men unto me. So Jesus has already made that invitation. He says, I've been lifted up. That's your invitation. And I have already made my effort. I've reached down to you. I came to earth. I lived and I died. And I have made my invitation to you. And now it's your turn to draw close to me. So if we will draw close to God, then God the Father will send his blessing upon us because we are revering his son in that way. So it goes on to say in the last part of verse 8, Wash your, your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now, um, maybe we understand that right now better than at any other time. Uh, I don't know about you, but over the past uh, couple of months, I have washed my hands more probably in the last two or three years combined. Uh, I, I'm very, very, very conscious about uh, the exposure to germs around me right now. Well, we'll notice this. The scripture says that we need to be very conscientious of the spiritual bacteria that's around us as well. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now, how can we do that? By drawing close to God. How can we purify ourselves? By coming close to the living water and allowing the living water of Jesus to wash us clean. You see, that's the way that we can do this. And, and it goes on, and in verse 9 it says, Grieve and mourn and wail. Change your laughter into mourning and your joy to gloom. Now, again, doesn't that sound negative? But I want you to understand what James is saying in this moment. He is saying sin and improper attitudes among Christians is devastating. He is saying that uh, our attitudes and our improper emotions are devastating to this world. And it's something that we need to be crying about. It's something that we need to be mourning over. And so he's saying we've got to start taking sin in the church very seriously. And we need to do something about it. So then he says, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. I have been praying and praying, uh, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, over the past several weeks, uh, ever since this pandemic started and we were separated from one another. You know, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, God says, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Well, in the same way, James has instructed us to humble ourselves before the Lord so that he will lift us up. Uh, if there was ever a time, <laughs> I feel a need to be close to many of you right now, but I also feel a need to just humble myself before the Lord because I want to be lifted up. I want us to not only be back worshiping again, but I want us to be doing more this time. You know, the next situation, the next pandemic we go through, the next trial we go through, it may impact the church even more than this one. And I think it's very, very important the way by which we come back together. I think it's very, very important that whenever we gather together, that we come with the resolve that, that God has lifted us up and we're going to make a difference this time for the Lord. 
He closes in the last uh, two verses of our lesson today by saying, uh, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but you're setting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Now, I want you to understand something of what I think that this particular passage is saying. It's talking about um, individuals who may have had a sordid past. Do you remember in the early church, we would read excerpts in various passages how people did not trust Paul because of his sordid past. People would judge him early on in his ministry because of his sordid past. Were it not for Barnabas, and I want to remind you that Barnabas wasn't even his real name, but Barnabas made such a difference in the church, and the name Barnabas means the son of encouragement. He was such an encourager in the church that he was able to see into the hearts of people. He didn't judge them. He allowed God to do that. He did not judge their past. He judged what Christ had done through them and what uh, he had seen and witnessed with his own eyes. I want to tell you, in my lifetime, I have had the privilege of uh, witnessing uh, alcoholics and drug addicts and pornography addicts. Uh, uh, I've seen individuals like this come to Christ. Uh, I have some close personal friends right now. At one time, they had a mess of trouble with narcotics. And, and God has transformed their lives. I, I've seen people with various forms of addiction who were sin sick. And it would have been awfully easy for an individual to have pointed their finger and said, I know what you've done. I know what your past is like. But some of these individuals are my heroes to a degree. Because they've not only risen above their sins, but they have taken... Uh, lessons learned from their past, and they are passing it on and, and helping others so that they won't get in the same mess that they themselves got into, or helping others who are in that same mess be rescued from that. So God has not called us to judge. He's called us to share the gospel. And when Jesus saves, we need to trust in the power of that miracle. There was a great uh, song that was written uh, several years ago, a Southern Gospel song. And the last line of that song says, But the greatest of all miracles was the day my Jesus saved me. Yes, I know what Jesus did for me. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for this day. Lord, I hope and pray that you'll take this lesson and use it. Allow it to be fruitful to those who have listened to it today. Lord, you know our needs. You know our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would rise us up and that you would perform a miracle in our nation, dear Father. That, Lord, you would not only save us from this pandemic, but that you would save America from her sins. And, Father, I pray that as far as this corner of the world is concerned, that you would allow us in our corner of the world to make a difference in introducing people to Jesus Christ. Help us today, for it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you.